Hi, my name is Dr. Garrett Dirkmott, and today I'm going to talk to you about some interesting aspects of early Mormon history and the life of Joseph Smith. I want to thank Standard of Truth Tours for producing this podcast so I have a chance to share this information with you. hope you find it interesting. I know that for many people it's something they haven't ever heard before. But I want to start with something that we all know, and that is that when Joseph was first visited by Moroni, he was told, and I'm sure this wasn't the easiest thing for Joseph to hear, that his name would be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues, or that it should be both good and evil spoken of among all people. It must have been pretty difficult for him to hear, and I think anyone who's a, a member of the church or even knows about Mormonism today is well aware that Joseph Smith's name is both good and evil spoken of. And so I want to look a little bit about the, the trajectory of this uh, evil speaking of Joseph Smith. Where does so much of it come from? One of the first people to speak out ill of Joseph Smith was, in fact, uh, one of the leading uh, other religionists of the day, a man by the name of Alexander Campbell. Alexander Campbell, uh, he's the founder of a movement that will come to be known as the Disciples of Christ, is very negative towards Joseph Smith in just first hearing about the Book of Mormon, and then he actually goes through and writes uh, an extensive rebuttal of the Book of Mormon when it's first published. Campbell, like many other people, operates on the idea that, that Joseph Smith has simply produced the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith wrote it. Um, as, as Campbell says here, I cannot doubt for a single moment that he is the sole author and proprietor of the Book of Mormon. And then later he'll say, it is as certainly Smith's fabrication as Satan is the father of lies. And so he's going to put forth this kind of simplistic argument that Joseph Smith had somehow written the entirety of the Book of Mormon. Now for Campbell, he feels like the book is so absurd that no one's going to follow it, no one's going to listen to it, no one's ever going to accept it. And that's what many people thought when they first heard about the Book of Mormon or when it was first published. But as 1830 turns into 1831 and then 31 to 32 and on, the church goes from a very small group of, of, of believing members, those who accept the Book of Mormon and, and Joseph Smith as a prophet, to one that is, is gaining strength by the hundreds and by the thousands. And after the church is located in Kirtland, Ohio, this rapid growth of the church becomes a real point of consternation for uh, people in the area who don't want to lose their political power. They don't want to see this growing, what they think, heresy, this Mormon heresy that's, that's not preaching the same kind of Christianity that they've ever heard. And so the problem is just saying Joseph Smith must have written the Book of Mormon doesn't really explain very well why it is so many people are believing it. So we need an alternate explanation, those who are antagonists of Joseph Smith. They need an alternate explanation of what to do. And, and enter into the scene here uh, a man by the name of Dr. Falassus Hurlbut. Now, I opened up the podcast by saying my name was Dr. Garrett Dirkmont. I, I have a Ph.D. from the University of Colorado. Dr. Falassus Hurlbut has a Ph.D. from nowhere. Uh, in fact, uh, he's not a medical doctor either. His parents named him Dr., I guess as a way of, of lending a little bit of credibility to the family. Uh, and so his, his first name's actually Doctor, and then I guess to make sure that no one would ever uh, not use his first name, they named, gave him a middle name like Philastus, so, well, uh, you're going to use the first name. Um, we don't know exactly what uh, he looked like. We don't have an image of Dr. Philastus Hurlbut. So, you know, I've tried to come up with a couple artist renditions of what Dr. Philastus Hurlbut might have looked like. Uh, you know, this is probably a pretty good rendition. Maybe this. Um, ultimately, he could have easily looked like this as well. Um, naming your child uh, a doctor, just so people call him doctor, would be like me naming my son MVP of the NBA Finals, Dirk Mott. And you'd have to call him that. So, you know, move over LeBron, it's, it's MVP of the NBA Finals, Dirk Mott. Um, why, do, why do I spend time talking about someone with such a crazy name? Well, because this man has a greater, a disproportionate impact on uh, anti-Mormonism than almost anyone else in, in the history of the church. Many of the things that people say evil about Joseph Smith, the thing that Moroni promised him, they come directly from this man. How? How does this man have that much power? Well, we'll talk about it. 
by uh, June of 1833, and that's what this document is showing here, Joseph Smith uh, uh, is, is, is leading the church. The School of the Prophets has been established in, in Kirtland. And Philassus Hurlbut is simply an elder, uh, sorry, Dr. Philassus Hurlbut, I want to give him his due. Dr. Philassus Hurlbut is an elder serving on a mission in western Pennsylvania. While he's there in western Pennsylvania, he uh, apparently commits several uh, fornications or adulteries. And, and you can see here uh, that uh, what happens is that uh, he is Dr. Hurlbut, who is uh, accused of unchristian conduct with the female sex while on a mission to the East. It was decided that his commission be taken from him and that he no longer be a member of the Church of Christ. Uh, maybe it's a little bit easier if we read it like this, right? Uh, so Hurlbut has, he, he's, he's excommunicated. He goes and, and petitions his case before Joseph. Back then, they didn't have the same kind of church court system that exists in the Mormon church today. It's, we're the product of another 180 years of revelation. But you could still appeal your excommunication to a higher court. And in this case, Joseph Smith was the higher court. Hurlbut came and begged that he should be allowed back into the church. And Joseph Smith ruled that the, the bishop's court had, had done exactly right. They had excommunicated him for the many fornications he'd committed, especially even worse while he was a missionary. But because he begged so much to get back in, Joseph said, fine, we, we'll, we'll let you back into the church uh, because he was so penitent, so, so, so heartbroken, so uh, desperately wanting to get back in. Well, no sooner is he let back into the church than only a few days later he is going to once again commit adultery and once again become excommunicated. Um, only this time, instead of begging for mercy, he's actually going to start a paid, uh, a paid anti-Mormon speaking tour in the Ohio area. He's going to claim all kinds of things, that Joseph Smith isn't really an inspired prophet, that the church is corrupt, that it's, it's stealing money from its members. But one of the most important things that Dr. Philassus Hurlbut is going to claim is he's going to claim that he knows the actual origin of the Book of Mormon. The reason why the Book of Mormon seems to be very high-minded and seems to convey teachings that, that are converting people and convincing them and seem to be entirely outside of the, po the, 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 the abilities of Joseph Smith is because it actually wasn't written by Joseph. It was written by a one-time minister who's deceased uh, by the name of Solomon Spaulding. Hurlbut claimed Spaulding lived in western Pennsylvania, his family did, and Hurlbut claimed that while he was on his mission, he came across the manuscript that this Solomon Spaulding had written while he was alive, and it was word for word the Book of Mormon. Now, he doesn't really give an explanation of why he didn't leave the church immediately and expose it then. Uh, apparently, he had some more fornications to commit between then and there, but he's going to make this claim. He's also going to make many public threats against Joseph and Joseph's family, to the point where Joseph's going to write to Missouri, and he's going to say this to the saints there. I know you can't really read this very well. Uh, Joseph's not the best writer, even if you can read his handwriting. But he writes to them, We are suffering great persecution on account of one man by the name of Dr. Hurlbut. He actually writes Hurlbert here, but uh, Joseph, not the best speller in the world. Who's been expelled from the church for lewd and adulterous conduct. And despite us, he is lying in a wonderful manner. And the people are running after him and giving him money to break down Mormonism, which much endangers our lives at present. In fact, the public threats that Hurlbut is going to make against Joseph Smith rise to the level of, of, of Joseph being able to make a legal claim against Hurlbut that Hurlbut has said publicly he will wound, beat, or kill Joseph Smith or members of his family. Uh, as, as one uh, witness to the event said, Hurlbut had said in public meetings that he would wash his hands in the blood of Joseph Smith. Not exactly, you know, the person you're inviting to a dinner party, right? These claims, the, these, these claims of, uh, of, of, of that he was going to assault or kill Joseph Smith were taken seriously enough the Hurlbut is, is, is found liable by a court in Ohio, a non-Mormon court, which essentially orders him uh, uh, to, pay, uh, to pay a fine and, and places him on six months probation, essentially, uh, telling him to, to stop what he's doing. 
But that doesn't stop uh, Dr. Hurlbut. What he's doing, this, this breaking down Mormonism from the inside, because Hurlbut's able to claim, like so many people who weave the Mormon faith, oh, you don't understand, I do, I was a member, I saw the inner workings. And of course, he's able to make this powerful claim about the Book of Mormon. He is hired by uh, another important person in early Mormon history that we don't know, by the name of Eber Howe. Howe is the editor of the Painesville Telegraph, and he's going to publish the first comprehensive anti-Mormon book. It's called Mormonism Unveiled. It attacks Joseph Smith's character. It attacks the origins of the Book of Mormon. It attacks members of the church. Howe himself is, is uh, angry because uh, his sister joins the Mormon church. And if that's not enough, then his wife joins the church. He goes from being just someone who's fairly irreligious and doesn't trust religion at all to someone who hates Mormonism because he sees it as this kind of cancer that's infecting even his own family, his sister and then his wife. His wife even donates money to the redemption of Zion for the Zion's Camp March to give you an idea. Things are probably not all quiet on the home front there. So uh, how wants to create this, 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 this book here that you see on the screen, this uh, Mormonism Unveiled, and he hires Hurlbut to go back to Pennsylvania and to New York and to collect negative affidavits about Joseph Smith, the translation of the Book of Mormon, and the Joseph Smith family in particular. And surprise, surprise, someone who's being paid to collect negative affidavits apparently comes back with negative affidavits. Now, none of these original affidavits exist at all. I, I don't know the veracity of any of them. Uh, they are published in Eber Howe's book, but I don't know uh, whether or not this is what the people actually said. Certainly, there was all kinds of persecution in Palmyra, which is part of the reason why Joseph leaves. So it's entirely possible this is what some of the people are at least saying about him. But you can see this is a, 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 an example of one of these affidavits. I was acquainted with the family of Joseph Smith Sr. both before and since they became Mormons. And feel free to state that not one of the male members of the Smith family were entitled to any credit whatsoever. This is a very common 19th century attack, right? The Smith family's poor. Uh, they, they've had multiple crop failures. They're, they're essentially reduced to being day laborers. And in 19th century America, if you didn't have the ability to own a farm that you could produce enough on it that none of your family had to work outside of the farm, that was evidence to many people that you were deficient morally. There was something wrong with you. Uh, not that you had a turn of bad luck. That There was something wrong with you. There's a reason why they're talking about his credit. They were lazy, intemperate, and worthless men, very much addicted to lying. I don't even know what addicted to lying means. Actually, if anyone knows what addicted to lying means, Philassus Hurlbut would know that, so I'll give him that. Um, in this, they frequently boasted of their skill, which seems pretty incredible that if you're a really good liar that you tell everyone you're lying all the time. Digging for money was their principal employment. In regard to the gold Bible speculation, they scarcely ever told two stories alike, which means they're actually really bad liars. That's uh, Anyway, um, uh, uh, the, the, the Mormon Bible is said to be a revelation from God through Joseph Smith Jr. as prophet, and this same Joseph Smith Jr., to my knowledge, bore the reputation among his neighbors of being a liar. Right, so Parley Chase uh, apparently gives this affidavit. He collects dozens of affidavits like this, returns, gives them to Eber Howe, who of course doesn't want to vet any of them at all. I mean, this isn't uh, journalism, or, or maybe it is 21st century journalism. He's simply trying to publish negative things about the church. And of course, primary to the book Mormonism Unveiled is the argument, as you can see there, that... Uh, the probability that the historical part of the said Bible was written by one Solomon Spaulding more than 20 years ago. This argument, the Solomon Spaulding manuscript argument, was taken up by most antagonists of the church all throughout the rest of the 19th century. Whenever anyone started giving credibility to Mormonism, someone would simply say, well, we all know that that just came from a book that Joseph Smith stole from a pastor, and that's the reason why it sounds like it's from God. But, eventually, the world is going to find that manuscript. And uh, James Fairchild, uh, a college president, is going to examine this manuscript to see 
if it actually is the Book of Mormon. How similar is it? And this is what he says. There seems no reason to doubt that this is the long lost story. He's talking about the Spalding manuscript. Mr. Rice, myself, and others compared it to the Book of Mormon and could detect no resemblance between the two in general or in detail. There seems to be no name or incident common to the two. So not only is it not word for word, which is what Hurlbut claimed, and in fact, members of Solomon Spalding's family claimed, oh yes, father used to use the word Nephi and Lehi all the time. There's not even anything similar at all. As, as one person has said, the only similarities between the two uh, uh, is that there's a boat involved in both of them at some point, right? Um, as Fairchild goes on, the solemn style of the Book of Mormon in imitation of the English scriptures does not appear in the manuscript. The only resemblance is in the fact that both profess to set forth the history of lost tribes. Some other explanation of the origin of the Book of Mormon must be found if any explanation is required. This is a perfect example of a lie being repeated often enough that people simply take it as truth. All throughout the 19th century, antagonists of the church dismissed the Book of Mormon for the primary reason that it was actually just, a, it was just stolen as it was Solomon Spalding's manuscript. And here we find, by the end of the century, in fact, they didn't even resemble one another. This is a non-Mormon making this case and making this statement. Hurlbut, his negative affidavits, his threats against Joseph Smith, and Eber Howe's book have a long-lasting impact on Mormonism, even today. Almost every anti-Mormon statement from the early years of Joseph Smith's life, almost every one, between 1833 and going back to before the first vision, can be traced back to Eber Howe's book. The book that this wonderfully great doctor, the good doctor, Dr. Philassus Hurlbut, was paid to put together. It's a demonstration of how sometimes people who feel passionately about things want to accept something as evidence and as fact, not because it's good evidence, not because Philassus Hurlbut is someone that we should be trusting, certainly not with our wives apparently, but because the, he's saying something that we already want to believe. And that's the case for many antagonists of the church. So I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I hope to share a couple of more uh, other interesting uh, church history tidbits. Again, I want to thank Standard of Truth Tours uh, uh, for, for setting this up. Um, I'm going to be uh, hosting a a tour with them, standardoftruthtours.com. Uh, this summer, we're going to be going to Palmyra and we're going to be going to Kirtland. We can actually go find the grave of Eber D. Howe and you know you can uh, pay your, your respects for this uh, earliest of anti-Mormons. That'll be this summer uh, between June 15th and June 20th. So if you're interested in that, I urge you to go to standardoftruthtours.com and I really thank you for listening.